This, this is, is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review with Gilad Halpern. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, a program dedicated to the word, to the thought and to debate, brought to you by the Van Leer Jerusalem Institute, which promotes humanistic, democratic and liberal values in the social discourse in Israel. I'm your host, Gilad Halpern, and every week I'll be engaging in close encounters of the intellectual kind with writers and scholars, or simply people of ideas of all types and vocations who have done something to make our lives a tad more interesting. My guest today is a religion scholar at Tel Aviv University who has just submitted his doctoral dissertation and is joining me now to discuss one of his numerous research interests, and that is neo-paganism in Israel today. Shai Ferraro, hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Hello, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So, paganism in the Jewish state? You must be kidding. No, seriously. Yes. Uh, <laughs> how, how big is uh, uh, this phenomenon? Is there anything to be reckoned with? Well, you know, numerically, it's really insignificant. We're talking about probably in around 200 people who could be classified as uh, neo-pagan and are part of uh, the neo-pagan Israeli community, which is mainly um, internet-based, web-based, uh, around Facebook and other websites, other social media. But they do uh, meet uh, occasionally for social gatherings and for ritual purposes. Mm-hmm. And, and what do they do? Do they worship gods that uh, uh, some uh, people worshipped thousands of years ago? Yes, exactly right. Yes. Uh, these deities could be drawn from a variety of uh, pantheons. Usually it's from... Uh, the Celtic uh, and the Northern Euro- and Western European-based pantheons, also from ancient Greece and Rome, um, and also from uh, very local uh, Mesopotamian or Canaanite uh, Is it predominantly pantheons. Western or Middle Eastern? Type no, of it paganism? is actually predominantly Western uh, mm-hmm. for reasons that uh, maybe we could yeah, yeah, please delve do. into I, I'm, later. I'm, no, no, yeah. no, let's do it now. I'm wondering whether it's just uh, sort of uh, all sorts of uh, geeks who opted for paganism instead of Dungeons and Dragons <laughs> right. and stuff like that. Well, what I could tell you is that there is a significant, there is actually a significant overlap between the The neo-pagan community in Israel and the role-playing community in Israel, people who would go to uh, the Icon Festival or the Olamot uh, Conference, uh, mm-hmm. which are like the Israeli Comic-Cons, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so so th- do they see it as, as a truly religious yes. a ritual? Yes. Uh, because going to the Olamot Conference is not, of course, isn't necessarily yes. that. So uh, the vast majority of them uh, would definitely see it that way. Uh, you can uh, basically divide people who are into neo-paganism and the relation to the actual deities uh, into several groupings. Yeah, you would have uh, people who are uh, hard polytheists, yeah, who actually believe in the reality of every single god and goddess from these the pantheons that they worship, right? You would have uh, someone who is more of a soft polytheist who probably just see all of the various goddesses, for instance, as depictions uh, of basically just one goddess ultimately, mm-hmm. right? And you would also have people who see these deities mostly as uh, archetypes that exist, you know, in some basic way in the human psyche somehow uh, and could be... approached and uh, thereby activating something dormant deep inside us in the human psyche and imagination. And some other people would uh, see it as purely, you know, something psychological that we use in order to achieve this exact same uh, result, mm-hmm. right? It, it is paganism, I mean, I'm trying to understand the motivations of those people. Yeah. Do they see it as just like any other alternative lifestyle or culture? faith or you know anything that do you lump them together for that matter with i don't know israeli hari krishna or jubus and people like that or are there really unique characteristics to them yes there, there certainly are um if you would talk about neo-paganism in the west basically just to give you um a few guidelines 
So neo-paganism is an umbrella term that could describe various attempts uh, to reinvent or recreate or rediscover various ethnic and uh, religious um, traditions from mainly from the European pre-Christian world but also from other types of uh, civilizations and you can actually see various denominations within uh, these uh, broad terms yeah you could have wicca or druidry or people who worship the uh, northern nordic uh, pantheons they uh, call themselves asatru uh, or odinists from derived from odin right mm-hmm. uh, and basically if you would try to come up with these um, definitions, basic uh, characteristics that all these people could uh, adhere to, you would talk about mainly a polytheistic kind of uh, religion, right? That uh, you, you believe basically in uh, various goddesses and gods from various uh, pantheons or from one pantheon. And actually the, the majority of neo-pagans are eclectic, so they build their own tradition basically mm-hmm. instead of being initiated to a specific one and they just you know gather their own um, information from various sources and build their own very private tradition but the Israeli context is, is somewhat yeah. different for several reasons one religion is a lot more predominant in the public sphere than it is in Europe or elsewhere in the in the West and also the Idolatry is one of the biggest transgressions in Judaism. Exactly. That's why most neo-pagans in Israel, uh, they actually live in fear of uh, popping up on the government's radar, and especially the uh, ultra-Orthodox, the Haredim. Is, is there a law radar. against idolatry in Israel? No, there, there is no law against, specifically against idolatry, but what you can find is the anti-witchcraft law. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's uh, a legacy of the British mandate that we have, because the, uh, if you go back to the um, uh, Middle Ages and the early Renaissance period, right, you had the uh, witchcraft persecutions, right? Uh, tens of thousands of people, mostly women, were hunted down and accused of being witches. And some of them were actually uh, burnt uh, at the stake or drowned. etc right now when you uh, arrive at the 18th century by the time of the enlightenment people have a change of heart mostly the uh, nobility and the aristocracy uh, the scholars they realize that okay there really isn't such a thing as witchcraft right and, and it's not as menacing as it had thought to be. no there is no witchcraft and Uh, it doesn't exist. We have somehow made a terrible mistake and killed all these people, right? But from now on, every person who tells you that he is a witch, he is guilty of fraud. He's right. trying to deceive you. So this was the law in Britain, in the UK from, I can't remember the exact year, but from the 18th century up until 1952, when the anti-witchcraft law was uh, repealed and they made a new law. And we actually never repealed that anti-witchcraft law, and we still have it. And actually, a couple of guys in uh, Tel Aviv University, in the law faculty, they made MA thesis on this. Right. Uh, what the law actually says is that it is illegal for you to charge money for an act of witchcraft. You can say that you're a witch, uh-huh. yeah? Yeah. But you can charge money for that because this is uh, deceiving. Okay, so the, the legal aspect is, is pretty clear. But then again, there's the social and normative aspect. Yeah. Uh, how are these people looked at? I mean, I'm, I'm sure that it's frowned upon even by people who are not necessarily that religious. Yeah. So, uh, you know, neo-pagans in Israel, they are actually shielded from... by the fact that no one in Israel knows about neo-paganism or, or uh, Wicca and uh, stuff like that, right? Oh, no, so, so it's the, the general the public doesn't know that, that yeah, saves them. They don't really know that people like this exist even in the UK or the US, right? No, no, no but it's part of your research. You actually met with those people yeah. and interviewed them. How do their, I don't know, families and immediate surroundings react? Yeah, well... Unless um, they don't know either. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, a lot of the time that's exactly the case, that these people are conducting their lives, even when it comes to friends and families, they stay inside the broom closet, 
right? That's uh, something that they borrowed <laughs> from the LGBT community because witches ride on brooms, sure. right? So, <laughs> uh, so they are inside the broom closet and they don't tell their uh, their families. Their pa- usually, you know, the, the parents, how would the parents react? This is not how I raised you. So, so, and, so, so yeah, exactly. So how, how did you reach them? Yeah. If it's so <laughs> secretive and which makes it all the more sinister, but that's a different issue. Um, how did you find them? Yeah, well, um, when my wife as a teenager used to work at uh, this uh, bookshop, this alternative bookshop that was actually uh, uh, serviced as some sort of a hub back then mm. for members of this uh, community, uh, she had a few contacts and through there, you know, uh, she gave me some names. I contacted Is that them. why you married her? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it had some part uh, to do with this, probably. Yeah, yeah, um, some of the appeal. Okay, so now let's uh, let's take it to uh, another more historic and no less interesting uh, perspective, because paganism in the Israeli context is uh, certainly not new. It has a history here, and it harks back to uh, Canaanism. Yes. Uh, which uh, reached uh, a short-lived fame in the 1940s and 50s. It oh, you're wa- talking about present days, uh, contemporary Israel, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, in, in, yeah exactly, about, about Israel. We'll, yeah. we'll get to the sure. prehistoric uh, right. uh, period that they, they were referring to. But in a way, contemporary neo-paganism has some sort of say, unresolved issues with, with Canaanism. But just, okay, so let's start by actually explaining what 20th century Canaanism was. It was an, a neo-Hebraic critique of uh, Zionism. Please tell us more. Yes, exactly. Um, the Canaanite movement of the 1940s and 50s really revolved around uh, the figure of Yonatan Ratosh, who was one of Israel's most famed 20th century poets. And he actually began as a revisionist Zionist in the 1930s. Uh, and, but gradually he uh, moved into a more radical stance. And uh, this was uh, as a result of meeting uh, certain uh, individuals, certain thinkers uh, back in the day. And uh, also primarily because of the discovery of the writings of Ugarit. Ugarit was... A city that is uh, that existed in uh, ancient times, and it was uh, discovered uh, during the late 1920s in uh, what is today uh, Syria. And basically, the writings of Ugarit, uh, Ugarit was uh, you know a kind of a Canaanite city, and that was the first time that we had a glimpse of ancient Canaanite culture and religion. That was not, you know, uh, from the Hebrew Bible, mm-hmm. which is obviously also biased. Yeah, it has an axe to grind. Yes. Um, and what people, what a lot of people realized back then is that the ancient Hebrews and the ancient Canaanites actually had a lot in common. So what Ratosh wanted to do was actually to erase all of the, he really connected what it means to be a Hebrew to the land, to the actual land of the Hebrews, or to ancient uh, Canaan. And for him, for instance, uh, the 2,000 years of uh, Judaism in the diaspora, this didn't really fit into all of that and should actually just be deleted. So, so mo- modern Judaism for him was actually an aberration exactly. from the calling of the Jews. Yes, well. exactly. So what he wanted to do is to recreate a new Hebrew nation that would consist of the both Jews and Arabs, actually, who live in this Semitic area here, uh, which you could call Greater Canaan, right? Mm-hmm. And that is, by the way, regardless of what the Arabs thought about that, right? Yeah, but, but his idea was that the Arabs would do the same with, with yeah. Islam, that they would go back to, I mean, the, the native populations exactly. of, of the Middle East would, would undergo the same process that he wants the Jews to undergo. Yeah, yeah, something like that. And uh, this obviously was incompatible with mainstream Zionism. So, uh, and with well, reality, as some would argue. Yeah, so what actually was the biggest calamity of the Canaanite movement was, uh, which was, it was numeric, uh, numerically insignificant uh, 
anyway, but the biggest calamity was actually the founding of the State of Israel in 1948. So this movement uh, continued into the early 50s, but later it was... And people like Amos Kainan, for instance, were members or affiliated with this movement, but it really disintegrated yeah, high, after high that. High-profile intellectuals, but at the end exactly. of the day, there were very few. Exactly. There were very few, and they disintegrated uh, during the 1950s. All right, so fast forward to yeah. 21st century neo-paganism in Israel. Do they see the Canaanites as their heritage in any way? Also, one, one thing that we need to uh, spend a bit more time on is the fact that Canaanism had uh, very clear political implications on top of religious, whether there were any, and, and cultural, because yeah. they, they said that modern identities in the uh, Middle East, whether it's Jewish or Arab or Muslim or whatever, undermines the prospects of uh, harmonious living in Israel, especially in the case of the Israelis. Do the 21st century pagans here in Israel see their ritual as having any sort of political implication? Um, most of the Israeli neo-pagans that I've met and also through the um, academic survey that I conducted uh, that most of the community actually answered. So it's like more like a census or something like that. So uh, most of them would either be left-wing or apolitical, uh, which is actually, you know, kind of uh, left-wing anyway, but just not calling it that. And uh, that's offensive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, sorry. Go no, on. but if you could actually see the answers to other uh, um, socio-economic and political questions uh, in the survey, you would see that uh, basically people who are apolitical answer pretty much like they just don't who, see themselves. Yeah. As uh, so one of their biggest qualms with uh, Ratosh would be that he was actually you could see him as a right winger today and uh, also someone who had the uh, fascist uh, elements within his perception probably also due to his uh, the influence of the romantic uh, movement on him people like nietzsche do they see do they know who watoshi is oh, yeah, in the they first def- place do they yes definitely people who are uh, who either see themselves as Canaanite reconstructionists today or, you know, try to um, infuse their eclectic neo-paganism with Canaanite practices and deities, they definitely know who Ratosh was and they read his writings, uh, his manifestos and the poetry, and they would uh, often quote from him and uh, gain inspiration from him but at the same time they would say uh, his political views are really not my cup of tea Mm -hmm. right Right. Uh, so they would not go as far as trying to also embrace the political implications of of, uh, uh, 20th century Canaanite but they actually engage seriously with the legacy of uh, yes mm -hmm. definitely and uh, one should also remember that, uh, well, you know, what I've been trying to do as uh, part of this larger article that this presentation that I'm giving at the conference is based on is trying to uh, see if there, if there could have been any kind of link between this uh, mid-20th century uh, Canaanite movement and the uh, contemporary neo pagans uh, today, and uh, the answer is that there wasn't, because the uh, Canaanite movement was a uh, cultural, political movement, but they were in no way a spiritual movement. Mm-hmm. They were secular people, and they really did not engage. Uh, were not engaged in spirituality, and that, um, that's really the main difference. Yeah. Yes, there are actually kind of a, uh, there is a very interesting uh, kind of uh, I won't say conspiracy theory, but uh, kind of an urban legend about that movement that was actually this rumor was started back then in the late nineteen uh, forties, which actually led to them being called the Canaanites, right? That Mm -hmm. was not their original name. I think the original name was something like the Committee for the Formation or for the Coalition of the Hebrew Youth, right? right? Mm -hmm. And it was Abraham Shlonsky, another very known poet, who gave them this nickname, the Canaanites. A pejorative one. Yeah, a pejorative one, which they actually later embraced uh, wholeheartedly. But uh, this rumor was that, uh, well... 
It is a fact that some of the younger followers of Ratosh actually enlisted into a specific uh, company in the Palmach. Mm. I think it was company, the sixth company that was stationed, I think, in the Jezreel Valley or someplace else. So there was a rumor back then in the Yishuv period, pre in the British Mandate period, that uh, some of these young individuals... Uh, were caught uh, dancing naked around uh, a naked woman who symbolized uh, Ashtoret, the goddess uh, Ashtoret, Canaanite goddess of uh, sexuality, etc. Uh, and um, that they were later, you know, impeached from the uh, Palmach. Uh-huh. Uh, and there were actually kind of uh, various rumors about who this naked woman was. Some people said that it was Noah Eshkol, uh, the daughter of our third, uh, the person who would be the third prime minister of Israel. And right. she was a very known choreographer in Israel late in later years. She denied it, obviously, and did not really understand how could she be implicated in some Something like that. And this whole thing was probably just a vicious rumor that actually tells us a lot more, not about the Canaanites, who were really a bunch of secular people, but uh, about the fears of the, yeah, the people m- in the, the mor- issue. Of, moral panic. Yeah, the moral panic mm. and it, that how easy it was for people back then to believe that people who would engage with the Canaanites, the ancient Canaanites, would also uh, come back, uh, would degenerate as they would see it yeah. into actual worship of Canaanite deities. Mm-hmm. Now, and do you think this is part of the reason why the neo-pagans keep a low profile? Uh, yes, definitely, because even today uh, you can see uh, how um, LGBT people are treated and how people of various uh, uh, other new age um, forms of spirituality are treated. So neo-paganism, which could be viewed as taking this uh, rebellious uh, theme to the extreme against the um, and in, being incompatible with the current politics of identity in Israel. Um, so that could be seen as either threatening by the state. Sure. Yeah. So all right. The- Shai Ferraro, I'm afraid this is all we have time for, but uh, people who are interested are more than welcome to come and hear you speak at the conference of the Association of Israel Studies uh, in June in Jerusalem. Uh, thank you very much for coming in today. Thank you. I was glad to be here. Yeah, all thank right. Very thanks very much. And also big thanks to Alex Benish, our sound engineer, and to the Van Leer Institute for their generous support. If you like this podcast, there are many more where it came from. Just go to www.tlv1.fm slash podcasts and take your pick. Music